The gold price has just made a new record all-time high. Banks are now jumping on the bandwagon with ING saying that the gold rally is just getting started. Bank of America also sees gold hitting $3,000 an ounce. If you haven't reached out to us at ITM Trading, I strongly urge you to book a strategy session where someone will reach out and connect with you and educate you about creating a wealth preservation strategy centered around owning physical gold and silver. You can easily book that in the Calendly link of the description of the video. Do it, you won't regret it. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni and welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show here on ITM Trading. We are coming to you from Times Square, New York, from the heart of it all. And joining me today is a guest uh, who is no stranger to the financial world. He has over three decades experience uh, working in finance. He's the founder of Finance Technologies and the author of Cause Unknown, the Epidemic of Sudden Death in 2021 and 2022. He has uh, incredible observations on many topics, and obviously I want to get his point of view on everything happening in the world right now. So please welcome back to the show, Edward Dowd. Edward, so good to see you. Daniela, great to be here. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, it's it's been a crazy weekend. We were just saying in, 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 in just in, in a moment how everything can just turn. So obviously, I want to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, the, the horrific news of the second assassination attempt. Obviously, I want to talk to you about uh, the global debt, what you call it's the everything bubble, and the clock has been set for the, the unwinding of it all. I want to talk uh, UFO sightings and the hearings that are about to begin, and payrolls, because you have an interesting opinion on that. But let's first start uh, with the election and the second assassination attempt on President Trump. I mean, can this election get any crazier? It's nuts. Yeah, it's what insane. Were your it's insane. And, uh, you know, so yesterday, the information was coming out fast and furious. In the first assassination attempt, I, I, I hesitated and waited several days before I made a comment. I made a comment pretty quickly on Twitter. Uh, suggesting uh, that this one was different than the Butler one because that was a publicly known event that anybody could figure out where Trump was going to be. This is a different situation. This was a apparently a golf outing that was called a snap outing that was called at the last minute. And the assassin knew uh, where, uh, that Trump was going to be on the golf course. The assassin knew what hole to go to. The assassin knew where, 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 where to set up. So the questions in the framing should be, how did he know and who helped him? That's it. And so that suggests there's a wider conspiracy and it's not a lone gunman. That's, that, those are the questions that need to be asked. There's a sheriff down in Florida who's asking those questions today. He's on record uh, asking the same questions. So that's the framing. Uh, this does not seem like a random lone crazed gunman. And he's got connections to the Ukrainian recruitment. Uh, there's, there's a lot of speculation. He is a CIA asset. So there's, there, there's a lot of there there right now. And my conclusion is that someone uh, uh, in, in, in our government probably helped him. And that's what we're going to find out eventually. So you are optimistic that the truth will come out? I think this time there's a better shot. Governor Ron DeSantis has come out and said he's going to mm -hmm do their own, they're going to, Florida, the state of Florida is going to do their own investigation. People don't trust the FBI. The FBI has been known for years to be the cover-up uh, operation of whatever happens. So I think we have a better chance of getting to the truth, but we don't need to go, we don't even need to um, get the full truth. We just know that the, the gunman knew where to be at the right time. And there's just, there's no way he didn't have help. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely horrific. And I was watching an interview um, right before you came on, Edward, with Tennessee Senator Haggerty, who said that the U.S. is coming to a crisis point very, very soon. And he, he says it has a lot to do with the, the rhetoric surrounding this election and that it really, everyone has to just tone down the rhetoric, you know, of pointing the fingers of, you know, Trump being a threat to democracy or he's a fascist or whatever. 
is what has led to this point. I mean, you've seen other leftist organizations pointing the finger to Trump in his campaign and that he almost put himself in this position. I mean, what's your take on how the, 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 the blame game the media can take here and what's happening? Well, you know, look, uh, the rhetoric should be toned down, but they're going to ramp it up because uh, you wanted to you want to divide people as much as possible so that they don't see the big the big game afoot. And the big game afoot is that we're at the end of a hundred year banking system that started in you know uh, 1913 with the Federal Reserve. This is about the military industrial complexes around uh, the globe wanting to hold on to power and their printing machines. And uh, everything you see is literally an attempt to keep the system going. It needs ever increasing amounts of debt and expansion and, and new excuses to, uh, you know, put everybody in fear. So division and hatred are actually part of the game and they're trying to stoke it on purpose because, you know, there's a meme uh, that's that's been going around for years that shows a king on a parapet and down below are the, uh, uh, the peasants with their pitchfork and torches. The advisor leans over and says, you don't need to fight these people. All you need to do is convince the pitchfork people that the torch people want their pitchforks. And that's, just, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's, that's been, that, that, that goes back to ancient Babylonian times. That's how you control the masses. Well, to that point, I'm happy you brought that up because uh, you've been saying, uh, you know, since I've known you, Edward, that this is the global sovereign debt bubble, the everything bubble. And you point to what just happened to Injit. Behind, which took a lot of us by surprise. And now you say that the clock has been set for the global unwinding of the debt, and it's, and it's going to be in conjunction with a weakening U.S. economy. I'm predicting it's just the clock getting started. So let's get your thesis here as you see this global unwinding of debt happening. Yeah, so the global debt bubble has been building for 14 years. You got to go back a little bit. So the Fed system, uh, you know, lowers interest rates, creates a bubble, the bubble, they don't actually control where the, the money goes and there's a bubble that's created and the bubble usually ends when they raise interest rates, take away the punch bowl, then fraud, some fraud somewhere is exposed. In, in the 90s, it was the dot-com frauds, corporate fraud with Enron and WorldCom and uh, other companies that just went, disappeared overnight, went bankrupt. Then they had to blow another bubble to save the economy again and uh, that was a real estate bubble that ended up on the bank's balance sheets and that was just uh, that was just fraud everywhere and not one banker went to jail uh, i remind you then to solve that debt problem they needed to create more debt the system needs constant debt creation because money printing is actually debt creation so they printed more money created more deficits and for 14 years uh we had basically zero interest rates and uh it, it was going to pop at some point, but, but because it had gone to the, the, the fraud had rolled on to the central bank balance sheets, because remember, they bought all the fraudulent bonds to save the system, and, and the government spent like drunken sailors, the fraud rolled into politicians and central bankers. So here we are, and it was going to manifest eventually in the, current, the, the foreign currency markets, because eventually the release valve is FX, and that began in Japan. Japan kept their interest rates at zero uh, as the Fed was raising interest rates to five and a half percent. By the way, that's the fastest uh, rate of change increase we've ever seen in the history of the Fed. It went from zero to five and a half. So the money supply started coming down and Japan got into a bit of a currency crisis. And not that long ago, Japan, uh, the, the US dollar JPY uh, pairing trade went to 160, which was the uh, levels we hadn't seen since the 90s. So J Japan was uh, in the midst of a currency crisis. Their j debt to GDP is 290%, I, I think, versus our 120%. So they had to defend their currency and they raised interest rates 25 basis, just 25 basis points in, in August. And we saw what happened. The, the, the Nikkei crashed and, 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 and the US stocks followed. That was the beginning. That's the, the, the clock starting. It's going to, you know, it doesn't happen uh, overnight. There was a lot of uh, coordination between the Fed and the, the Bank of Japan. Right. And they're basically trying to hold it together. And since, since uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the markets uh, swooning in August, 
uh, the, the, the JPY US dollar pair trade has gone from, you know, 160 to 139 last night. So the Japanese yen is strengthening as the, as the yen carry trade is unwinding. And the yen carry trade is a, is a trade that's been going on for decades. People borrow in yen because interest rates are zero and uh, they uh, lever that up and, and, and buy foreign assets. So the, the, the problem is uh, that Japan is caught between a rock and a hard place. Save, save the currency or unwind the yen carry trade globally. And I suspect they're getting pressure from the US government and the Fed and they're caught between a rock and a hard place. So that's, that's the clock starting. And we also, in conjunction, have a weakening U.S. economy uh, that we were predicting a recession in, in the second half of 23. Right. That didn't happen primarily because uh, of government's unprecedented government spending, government job creation, illegal immigration added to the GDP. But that juice uh, peaked in March, according to our early cycle indicators. And we never went above. We have a, a, a metric, it's, you know, above zero is expansion. We got right below zero and then we rolled over. So we, we, our economic cycle indicators have been rolling over since March. And we believe it's gonna pick up speed. We have an election where every business right now is paused. I'm hearing from everybody that no one's spending any money. Large projects are, are, are not gonna happen until after the election. So we're in a da dangerous time. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve is set to cut interest rates 50 basis points, 25 to 50 basis points this Wednesday. And typically speaking, everyone thinks that's a, that's a, a bullish thing for the markets. But if you look back yeah. at other, other economic downturns, the beginning of the Fed cut cycle is the beginning of the pain. So the pain is ahead. And, 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 and when they cut, if, if they cut on Wednesday, it's going to trigger, I think, a uh, massive reallocation out of stocks into bonds because bond people know now that the Fed is in a cutting regime and uh, they'll sell stocks to buy bonds. Yeah, and we are speaking before that decision. Do you feel they felt pressured to do the decision before the election? Because if they waited after the election, it would look fishy. I mean, why not just wait until after the election? Well, the problem is uh, there's lots of indications that there's financial stress globally. And, and, and uh, the, the Wall Street banks and anybody that's involved in leverage is clamoring for interest rate cuts. So it, in a very perverse way, the interest rate cuts themselves will, will, will trigger the financial crisis even more, but it's also needed uh, to, to keep a lot of these entities afloat. Right now, they're putting fingers in, in, in dikes. They're supporting the Federal, the Federal Reserve directly supporting Japanese banks. I, I want to get back to your recession indicator. So where, where are you, just to be clear, where are you at now with that? I mean, now the yield curve no longer signaling a recession. Uh, do we breathe a sigh of relief here? No, so the yield curve, this is actually when it begins. When the yield curve inverts and then, and then steepens, that's the beginning. Yeah. So because the, the, the bond markets are anticipating lower interest rates. So the bond markets, the Fed, uh, bankers are clamoring for lower interest rates because we have credit, credit problems throughout the globe that are being hidden, not talked about in the financial press. The system is very precarious right now, and everybody in, in the halls of power know it. And uh, the, the financial markets and, and the public at large will start to figure it out. The biggest tell for me is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has basically gotten out of most of his stock positions, accumulated his largest pile of cash, and where is he sitting? He's sitting in T-bills. He's earning 5% to wait. He owns 4% of the T-bill market, which is more than the Federal Reserve. Uh, this guy knows what he's doing and he's waiting. He's not looking for a 10, 20% correction. He's looking for uh, a 50, 60% uh, correction. And then he's gonna come in and buy on the cheap like he did in the great financial crisis. He was in cash before the great financial crisis as well. You brought up Warren Buffett. What did you make of his call to pull out uh, from Bank of America, a part of his position? I mean, he still owns a position, but a big chunk of it. I haven't done the work on Bank of America, but I rely on people on Twitter that are great analysts that I follow. And uh, they have been highlighting balance sheet issues in these banks for the better part of mm -hmm. six months. And we have to remember, uh, we had bank failures in March of 2023 that happened super fast. 
and there was panic and the Federal Reserve uh, did what was called the bank term funding program where they gave loans against uh, underwater bonds. Now the bonds that were underwater then were due to interest rate duration risk. And, you know, was, these were safe securities that had gone down 30% in value because of just interest rates going up. What the Federal Reserve is not going to do, uh, uh, give lend money against is bad credit. So these banks have commercial real estate loans, bad credit on their books. The Fed is not going to bail them out of bad credit. They bail them out of duration risk, interest rate risk, but not they will not give money for bad credit. When you were speaking about uh, companies halting spending, Edward, uh, I was thinking about how much the consumer, the American consumer is spending. And I wanted to bring this up, that consumer debt has hit a record again. Um, people spending, even if they know they don't have the money. U.S. consumer savings are completely gone. U.S. net savings as a percentage of gross national debt fell to negative 0.9% in Q2 of 2024. It's the lowest level since the great financial crisis. Savings have been negative for the last six quarters, quarters the second largest streak in at least 70 years. Why is the consumer living in fantasy land? Well, they're not living in fantasy land. That was actually uh, one of the, uh, that was the third reason why GDP held up like it did because they were drawing from their savings to basically live. So people are literally, uh, this isn't, you know, going out and, and, and buying, uh, you know, tchotchkes and, 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 and little trinkets. This is, this is, these are, savings being drawn down to meet basic needs. And once, and right now we're at the point where a lot of this credit card debt is gonna go, start going south, it already has, delinquencies are up, auto loan del del delinquencies are up, I think above COVID levels. So what we're gonna see is the consumer has no money, banks are uh, hitting credit issues, we're gonna see a, a fast and fear, when this, when this really hits, it's going to be like a sucking sound, and we're going to see violent financial moves. Wow. Um, what, when you're talking about rate cuts, I mean, one thing banks, most banks have revised uh, their forecast for gold, mostly bullish. We see ING, Bank of America, all looking at, you know, $2,700, $3,000 gold. What's your take? Is this, is this good news for gold? Are you bullish gold? Well, I'm bullish gold long term, but... In the meat of the panic, everything gets sold. So gold will correct. It won't go down. In the great financial crisis, it went down 50%. I think gold will correct 25% and then resume its bull run and go to new highs. So longer term, I'm bullish. But, it, you know, the safest asset, if you want to preserve your, 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 your um, purchasing power and your investing power, are T-bills, three-month T-bills. I... I want to get back to your point about the global unwinding of the debt. And I want to paint a picture for the people watching of how that will affect their life or how it starts unwinding or how it hits us. Um, also, going back to that week in August when we saw, uh, you know, the stocks melt down and then all of a sudden recoup, uh, how did that why did that happen? Did they allow that to happen? Was that orchestrated? Was that just? Well, I, I think the, it, there was manipulation in the foreign exchange markets to save uh, the Bank of Japan temporarily. I think the rebound rally uh, was technical in nature. People piled in again because right. the buy the dip mentality, mentality is quite strong. Technically, the market looks like it's 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 almost done. So basically, either either we had the high in July, uh, or and or we have a maybe slightly new high ahead in the next couple of weeks. But I don't want to get into it because it's too technical. But we're setting up for a very bearish uh, cycle that will, when it triggers, it's going to surprise many. So we're close to it being done. If you look at the value line geometric. Uh, averages that's that's like 1700 stocks since the peak in 2022 the average stock hasn't gone anywhere it, it's actually still down so most people's 401ks unless they're in the s p 500 index are still down from the 2022 highs so this has been a rally of ai 
seven stocks, the magnificent seven. NVIDIA is already cracked. There's questions about NVIDIA now. Uh, you know, the CEO is selling fast and furious, insider selling. There's questions about uh, the customer concentration. It is, after all, a semiconductor stock, which has cyclical uh, rhythms to it. And quite frankly, this reminds me of the telecom equipment boom, where um, Cisco and others were selling equipment to companies that had no revenues. Right now, NVIDIA is selling a lot of uh, equipment, chips, to, to start up AI companies that have no revenues, no revenues. And, 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 and Microsoft and Google, the other ones buying their equipment, have said, we don't have a revenue model yet for AI. So AI is just like you know the telecom equipment days. There's a lot of hype. The, uh, the, the equipment back then was bought with junk bonds. This is being bought with private equity. There's no revenues uh, models yet. So the bubble will burst and it's bursting right now. And NVIDIA stock, I'd be surprised if it goes to new all-time highs. I think, I think the top is in. Even if the money printer has started, even if they're just gonna keep, even if the helicopter bend days return? Well, the, the, the helicopter bend, bend days won't return until there is a crisis. That's what they, they can't start printing at it at right now. Lowering okay. interest rates, lowering interest rates is gonna cause asset allocation uh, re, uh, from from stocks to bonds. Everybody knows we're going in, into a recession most likely. So stocks will go lower. The question is how low? And when, did this, when does the Fed step in and do something strange? Um, the, you got to remember, interest rate uh, policy decisions on the monetary front have an 18-month lag. So when the Fed mm -hmm. started raising interest rates, we, m money, uh, money supply didn't start contracting until November of 2022. That's 18 months That's later. Right. Um, That's right. and, and then, and then, then 18 months from that year mark was May of this year. So if they start lowering interest rates, let's say they lower 300 basis points. It's going to take 18 months before that works itself into the real economy. So getting back to what um, life will look like if the clock has started and the stage is set for the global unwinding of this debt, what will lo life look like for us? Well, you know, it, it, we've been here before. I mean, you, you don't want to be in fear and panic. And if you've, you know, listened to people like Warren Buffett, others, myself, I've been saying for the better part of a year now, have some of your wealth in cash. And cash is U.S. government T-bills or money market funds that are government backed. And then, you know, when the panic sets in, the headlines are it's the end of the world and there, there, will, there will be a crisis that they'll point to as the reason for this uh, downturn, because they need an excuse that the central banks and politicians can't take the rap. And, and mathematically, this is how cycles work. The Fed pumps the bubble, they take away the punch ball because inflation starts to rear, rear its ugly head and the system you know, implodes every time. And it's, it's literally the system itself. So we'll need a war, we'll need an excuse. So there'll be a lot of panic and fear, but the, the key, if you're listening to me is, the sun will come up tomorrow, you, you know, you'll be fine. You, you know, this, this is not, life will go on. Life will go on. Could, is it bigger than the UFO hearings? I know you've been tweeting a lot about that and it's, you know, is that the next crisis? Well, is look, it the bird I think flu? The, the World War III would, would, would garner a lot of spending. You got to go back to COVID. The system was about to implode in 2019 and then COVID magically came along and we had warlike spending. I mean, the amount of spending right. we did with COVID was a war. So that's, they need wars and more government spending to keep the system going. So the next crisis could be World War III. We know that on Friday, um, the State Department has said they're gonna give Ukraine cruise missiles that they, they, they can fire into Russia, the heart of Russia. Putin has said, if you do that, that's World War III. So World War III would be useful to them. The UFO thing, I've been joking, but not really, because if you wanted to um, create the mother of all crises to uh, create justification for government spending, global uh, planetary defense would be a good one. And they just said this month that there's been sightings of large craft near nuclear sites in the U.S. and Congress is going to hold hearings. So, you know, for me, uh, the system itself creates the reason for uh, the chaos that we're seeing. The system itself is chaos creating. Um, 
Before I get to my question on the U.S. dollar, I know offline we were having a conversation regarding the payroll numbers, which and the revision of them, and which probably needed more uh, media attention. Um, what you call the fraudulent payroll numbers. I want you to talk to us about why this matters and is so important, and the domino effect it can have here. Yeah, so let, let's think about what we saw. In the 90s, we saw cor corporate fraud. Then, then it rolled up to banking fraud. Now we have government central bank fraud. This is where we are. And to keep, so the, 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 the bubble's gotten so big, to keep the thing afloat, we're now seeing fraud in government statistics. Like, there's always been questions about how they measure CPI and this and that. But right. we, saw, we saw blatant manipulation statistically, uh, observable blatant manipulation of the payroll numbers as early as uh, January, February, March. Lots of people were pointing it out. And then sure enough, uh, uh, about, about six weeks ago, the government came out and revised the payroll numbers down 850,000, just magically disappeared. And, right. and, and so I was speaking offline to a very prominent economist who wanted to remain anonymous, primarily because He's got clients on both sides of the aisle and he didn't want to you know, lose clients. But he said the implications of these fraudulent payroll numbers are so dramatic in that the Federal Reserve likely made bad policy decisions on them because they follow unemployment. Uh, business to, business uh, projects were greenlit because of these fraudulent numbers. So business people made bad decisions and market participants made bad decisions. And the implications of this are, are stark. And as we roll forward through time, more and more people will stop looking at the government numbers and take them at face value. And this is a problem. And if you looked at the last payroll number, the payroll headline number was not, was good, but the market decided to focus on, on the July and June revisions down. The markets went down that day. So the, people are getting the joke now. And as this ripples through the system, it just, it, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's, it, it's a loss of confidence in actual government statistics, which is not good for anybody. Want to get your thoughts on the dollar um, and Trump's proposal uh, to impose 100% tariffs on on countries who continue to shun away from the dollar. Many have criticized it, saying it would be a ca catastrophic move for the U.S. economy. Others applauding it. Obviously, where do you where do you sit on that? Well, I, you know, I've, I've talked to a bunch of people on Wall Street. Uh, Trump will be a weak dollar president. Uh, a weak dollar will attract capital to the U.S. To He wants to bring manufacturing back. So his policies will be weak dollar policies. The question, the dollar is going to go down in the near term because as the Fed starts lowering interest rates, uh, it'll, it'll weaken the dollar. The question we have to ask ourselves is technically, since the, the great financial crisis, the dollar has been in, in a stealth bull market. It bottomed in uh, uh, 08, 09, and it's been going to higher highs and higher lows. And there's a, there's a, there's a cycle and a rhythm to the dollar, and it's a four-year cycle. Uh, the dollar is going to go down. We're looking, my friend Tim Wood and I, and Tim Wood is a, uh, a research analyst, does a lot of work. Yes. He's looking for a four-year cycle low in the beginning of 25. So the dollar's going down. So we'll get a lot of people saying it's the end of the dollar, this and that. The level we need to watch for is 89.10 on the dollar. If it if it bottoms higher than that and starts to go back up and the four-year cycle low is put in uh, higher than that level, the bull market in the dollar is intact. If we break 89.10 going into this low, then something else is afoot. I, my expectations are that low holds and we go uh, to a new uh, high in the dollar and I've always said the dollar is going to fail off because that's how the system works. Is the dollars uh, and debt are destroyed, the dollar will rise because it's less debt is a higher dollar, more debt is a lower dollar. So, no threat to the dollar in the near future for you. I don't think the dollar is is doomed like everyone says, and we'll yeah. and I'll change my tune if we lose eighty nine ten. We're not right. anywhere near eighty nine ten. Why, why is Russia uh, taking such a big bet on gold? I'm sure you saw the headline um, that they're committed to, you know, daily purchases up until mid-October, um, upping it by like 600 percent, their gold purchases. Why the bet on gold? 
Well, they're in a war with us and they're trying to de-dollarize as fast as possible. So it makes sense for them to buy gold and, you know, gold uh, will provide them with uh, opportunities around the globe. They can lend against it, borrow against it, what, what have you. So mm. it makes it look, if I was uh, Putin, I would do the same thing because right now we have sanctions on him. Uh, we've cut, cut off their access to the SWIFT system. I mean, this is, this is, that, that's just, a, that makes total strategic sense. Edward, as we round up here and wrap up, uh, obviously we covered various topics, but I know many people at home are probably want to know, Edward, how long do we have till the wheels just completely come off here? Well, it, it, it all depends on the policy responses. Um, you know, I was on record after the bank failures in March. I said, there's two ways this can go, fast or slow. If it goes slow, that means the, the powers that be are controlling the implosion. And they did. So they did it. Look, whatever you think of the Fed and the system, speed kills. If this thing gets out of control, that means no one's in control. We don't want that. Uh, I'd rather see kind of a slow uh, uh, popping of the bubble. Stock markets go down 50% over two years like they did in 2000. It was a 50% clip to the stock market happened over two years. So you don't want to see speed. That's going to be panic. So I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. I'm rooting for the the, the, the money masters, but I, I also yeah. know the system, the system needs to change. So the, if you see uh, huge movements in stocks, that's an indication and, 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 and global markets that they've lost control and losing control is good for no one. So I think it implodes no matter what, it's just a question of speed. So it could happen quickly or slowly when it really starts to happen. I, I think we're closer uh, than, than most think. It could happen before the election. It could happen after. We don't know, but it, it, it's, not, it's not two years from now. Wow. Edward Dowd, I always appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you so much, Daniela. Great to be here. Yeah, great conversation. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. We'll have uh, more great content coming your way, so be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni show here on ITM Trading, and don't forget to sign up at daniellacomboni.com to stay on top of it all. Thanks for watching.